Good morning. Welcome to worship at Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. On a beautiful day, we come hearing beautiful music reminding us that we offer our hearts in worship to the Lord who is our firm foundation. And it is in that spirit that we come to this place. I'm glad that you are here today. And if you're one who is worshiping with us by television or online, we certainly want to welcome you as well and are glad that you have come to be a part of this wherever you are located. But if you're here in this room, we are so glad that you're with us. If you're a guest, we would love to know something about you. There's a card in the pew rack in front of you. If you take that card, fill it in, and uh, drop it later in the offering plate, it will give us an opportunity to share some about the ministries and what God is doing here at Second Ponce. We'd love to be able to share that with you. On the front of your bulletin cover, you will see these words, devoted to live, to love, to learn together. That is our theme as the month of August begins and as a new church year begins. We are devoted. Next Sunday is Promotion Sunday for our Sunday schools. Our younger folks will all move up a grade and have new classes. There are new classes beginning with adults. It will be a special day as we recommit ourselves to being devoted to those things that happened in the early church that made such a difference as the early church devoted itself to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayers. We do the same thing. Next Sunday is also a time when we recognize that school is about to begin. So we want to have an opportunity to pray for students and teachers and, and parents and administrators, everyone who's a part of what's happening with the beginning of school. We'll have a time called the blessing of the backpacks. So if you're a student, bring your backpack next week. You know, if you're a teacher, bring your backpack. Whoever has a backpack involved in education, bring it. We'll have a time of prayer and dedication next week. 
but today is the day to get ready. So following worship, all who are a part of the teaching ministry of this church have been invited to move to the fellowship hall. There will be a, a lunch there. And then Bo Prosser will be leading us in a training time, helping us understand about how we can teach and learn and be the family of God together in classes and small groups and so forth. I hope that you, if you're one of those teachers, will join us this morning. We welcome Bo. Bo, thanks for being here today, and we will learn from you this afternoon. That's what's happening in the life of this church. There are other things you will find listed in your bulletin program. For now, it is time to turn our hearts to God in worship, and I invite you to do so as we pray together. Loving God, we know that you are in this place. Help us to sense your presence. We know that you will be speaking to us. Guide us to hear your still, small voice. We know that you are working among us and in the world. Give us eyes to see what you are doing so that we might join in your work. Equip us, O oh God, for this kingdom service in this holy time of worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me in the responsive reading that is printed in your order of worship from 1 Kings chapter 8. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all that has been promised, which he sowed through his servant Moses. The Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. Therefore, devote yourselves completely to the Lord our God, walking in his statutes and keeping his commandments as at this day. Would you take the hymnal from the pew rack in front of you and turn to hymn number 488. Let's stand and sing.
This is Bumi Pekinwa. You probably remember it was about six weeks ago that Bumi came forward with her daughter Kiki, who is two, and declared that she wanted to make this her church home. You might not remember uh, that she had made her profession of faith before leaving her home in Africa, but not yet had a chance to be baptized. So as a part of her joining this fellowship, uh, Bumi has decided to make public her faith in Christ by following our Lord in baptism and into this ordinance that makes most public her commitment to follow Christ. And so, Bumi, what is your profession of faith? Jesus is Lord. Well, upon this profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You have been buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Let us pray. O oh God, in this sacred moment, let us all reclaim our own baptism and the commitments we made that day. Bless us in the walk of devotion and discipleship. And bless Bumi and her family as her Christian pilgrimage goes forward and she seeks ways to walk in your light, please you with her devotion. Protect her, guide her, and lead her through a life of devoted service as a representative of your love. We pray these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Kelly Denton is our staff member who gives outstanding leadership for children's ministry and has recently added a new assignment of adult faith formation and education. You see her name in the program that she would be saying a word at this point. Um, she has to be away from us today. A medical situation has arisen in her family that's caused her to, to not be here today. But we still want to have a moment to focus on the, the teaching and learning ministry of this church. Last week, we talked about this theme of devoted. To live, to love, to learn together. That's what we do when we come into Sunday school classes. That's what we do when we gather in a, um, a youth group. That's what we do when we go off on a children's retreat. We learn together. And out of that comes this rich koinonia, the fellowship of the church. So last week we talked about devoting ourselves in a new way, recommitting ourselves to this teaching and learning ministry of the church. Not everyone is a teacher. We are all learners. And we come to this place to open up the scriptures and to hear what God would say to us. Today we want to commission those who are our teachers. And so, let me ask, if you are a Sunday school teacher in our church, or if you're one who teaches perhaps children or others on Wednesday nights or at other times, if you are one who is a teacher, 
Would you stand for just a moment? Our teachers, would you stand? All right, just remain standing for a moment. Now, let me invite all of us to join together in this litany of commitment. And I would invite our teachers to read the bold part, but everyone, let's all join together in reading the bold part as our teachers lead us. Let us pledge ourselves anew to the service of God. May we be servants to our fellow men and women. May we faithfully guide and instruct the children of this fellowship. Strengthen us, O Lord, to help, encourage, and comfort others. Guide us by your spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us hope. We devote ourselves to you, our creator. You may be seated. And for all of these who are involved as teachers in our church, thank you for your commitment, your service, the preparation that you will, many of you, be doing even today and the preparation you do each and every week so that when we come to this place, we can all learn together. Let me offer a prayer of dedication then for all of us in this teaching and learning ministry of the church. Would you pray together with me? Gracious God, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to the earth to show us the way to abundant living. As he walked among us, Jesus was known as the teacher. His words of wisdom challenged people to live life at a new level. His stories taught us truths that were deep and rich. His miracles taught us of a God of great power. His death on a cross taught us of a love so amazing that he would make the ultimate sacrifice. His resurrection taught us to always live with hope because we worship a God who conquers death itself. Thank you, O oh God, for the things that Jesus taught us about the abundant life. We thank you that you have sent teachers in this church to help share that wonderful story of life. Just as the early church was devoted to the apostles' teaching, we gather each week to learn from gifted teachers who tell us about Jesus and his guidance for our lives. We pray that you will give these teachers wisdom, knowledge, and understanding for the high calling of teaching us about the good news of Jesus. We are grateful for their devotion and commitment to this holy work, and we ask that your grace will be sufficient for their needs and that you will grant them great joy as they teach in your name. Even as we pray for our teachers, O oh God, all of us pray for ourselves. Let every one of us grow in our devotion to the study of your word and to the community of faith that springs from this study. Open our minds and hearts to listen and learn. We dedicate ourselves as teachers and students to this foundational ministry of the church. We pray, O oh God, that all of us will be devoted to live, to love, to learn together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering all of us here today. We are so grateful for all the ways you have blessed us and that we are able to give back to you and our church. Continue to bless us throughout this service in fellowship with one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to extend a word of welcome for our anthem to our soloist, who is uh, Quinn Changis. She is one of my students at Woodward Academy. She's 16 years old. And she has some additional connections to this church that may interest you. She, uh, her middle school music teacher is in our choir, Susan Messer. And she went to preschool right here at Second Ponds. And uh, we did this piece on our school choir tour and she did such a lovely job that I invited her to sing and she agreed to come. So this is uh, O Lord Most Holy.
that is twice Quinn did not let you down. <laughs> Beautiful. Glad you were here. Thanks. Our scripture this morning, Romans chapter 12, I'll be reading the first eight verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, author of life, the one who is worthy of our great devotion, we offer ourselves to you. In your beautiful mystery, you have created not only this grand world, but breathed life into us, created us with purpose, enlisted us in your loving project of redeeming the world. So form us in our devotion. Show us the way lives are being changed by your love and inspire us. Activate our compassion and our commitment. And forgive us for living small. Forgive us for dreams that are too small. Forgive us for thinking too much of ourselves, and forgive us for thinking too little of ourselves. Ignite, ignite in us a clear image of what our place ought to look like in bringing your love to the world into fruition. May it start today in worship. In the name of Christ, amen. My earliest images of church, are they're more like snapshots than, than video footage, but I've, I've got some early memories that click into my head every now and then. One of the earliest memories I can think of is sitting uh, in one of those little wooden chairs, coloring a paper that was mimeographed and had that sharp smell of the mimeograph machine. I apologize to everybody younger than me, but I saw older people nodding. Everybody my age and older remembers what the purple ink smelled like. I remember broken brown crayons and coloring Moses' sandals or somebody, and I didn't know what it had to do with anything. Then I've got an early memory of worship. Um, no, I was not raptured by the sermon. Um, instead, it's a memory of my parents in worship, taking all of this very seriously. The minister of music would indicate that it was time to stand, and my parents would reverently stand and open the hymnal. And then they would show me with their finger where we were in the hymnal. And then we'd skip like four lines, and it was really confusing, and it took a while to catch on. And the minister would say, let us pray. My dad would close his eyes. 
anyway, as I said, it's, it's more of a snapshot than a movie. But I remember from an early age that my parents took this church stuff seriously. And I have vague memories of long sermons and long prayers and men, always men, thanking God for letting us be here today. But I wasn't sure I wouldn't rather be in a pickup baseball game at Honeysuckle Park. But here I was. But I was there because I didn't get a vote. Attending church was like attending school. It wasn't optional. I did play baseball at Honeysuckle Park and I played basketball and tennis and high school wrestling team and all the rest. I had plenty of sports and play and leisure in my life. But church wasn't an option. It was like school. And my parents didn't check with me to see if it was okay if I wanted to go. Eventually, and thankfully, it became more interesting for me. The Sunday school lessons started to have something to do with the struggles in, in my life. The sermons occasionally would hit on something I was actually interested in or struggling with. And then somewhere in high school this shift happened. It, it seemed sudden, it probably wasn't sudden, but it was clear to me that I was also to contribute something at church. Well, I had a job in high school. I was a lifeguard at the Dorval City Pool. It was the greatest summer job in the world. I hung out at the pool with my friends and got paid for it. My first paycheck after two weeks of working at the Dorval City Pool was $103. I thought it was a fortune. I'm running around the house with my check. And my dad said, you know that the first $10 of that check goes in the offering plate Sunday, don't you? Well, I guess if he'd been a literalist, it'd have been $10.30. But I got, the, I got the gist. But I wasn't happy about it. Ten bucks was a lot of money in the mid-70s. I could have taken Kathy Cowan to see the spy who loved me, bought pop popcorn and Cokes, and had change left over. Ten dollars was a lot of money. But I also knew I had to contribute in other ways, too. Th those of us in the youth group who didn't have a summer job, we were, of course, expected to be a part of vacation Bible school. It was also the era of Sunday night church. And our youth group put together an eight voice singing ensemble that would go to other churches on Sunday night and lead the worship service uh, singing songs. There were only about 11 of us in the youth group. So there were about eight voices in the ensemble, two shy guys who did the board. And after the youth minister heard me sing, he said, Doc, why don't you work up a little devotional? That would be good. But I had to do it. I, I had to prepare a little devotional. I had work to do to contribute. My point is, we were leading worship services before I could shave. We had stuff to do. If I'd have had a vote about my church involvement, I might have just taken Kathy to the movies instead. But I'm grateful to this day that it was serious business to my folks. My adult faith formed in large part by the devotion of my parents' faith. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Rome, he was addressing this issue about the fellowship of faith, to use his words, how, how it's supposed to be lived out. Because not everybody was taking church seriously like my parents did. Uh, he, he noticed that there were different kinds of church members, different kinds of involvement. His language, he said, there's the weak and the strong. We might use different terms today. But we know there are people in every church who seem to just dabble. And there are those who are serious 
about the fellowship of faith. Well, as you know, the New Testament letters were written to a specific community, a specific occasion. Uh, They all carry timeless truth, but there's always an underlying drama that colors in the story. And in the backdrop of this letter is a popularized version of Platonism. Now, you remember that the philosopher Plato had, had advanced the idea that there are two realms. There is the material, the physical, and there is the spirit. Material, bad, evil, always. Spirit, good, pure, always. According to Plato, God is spirit. We worship God with our spirit. We do whatever we want to with our bodies. It just doesn't matter much. They're two completely separate things. Paul says no. Paul says this is a false teaching because body and spirit are all entangled in the Christmas scandal. The Word has become flesh and dwelt among us. It's an embodied faith. We look at each other in the eyes across the Wednesday night table. We hug children on Sunday morning and remind them church is a safe place. I took Boomi into my arms a few minutes ago and put her into the waters of baptism, all splashing and messy and touch and personal. We greet each other on Sundays with handshakes and hugs and holy kisses. And I hand you a wafer and say, this is the body of Christ. Take, eat. This is an embodied faith. The Platonists can celebrate the idea of a holy Jesus, but we are the body of Christ. And the metaphor suggests at the very least that an individual Christian apart from the congregation, is not something the New Testament imagines. We are connected to each other the same way finger and foot are connected. Eardrum and elbow, they are connected to each other. We are the body of Christ, and the body doesn't work best when one of us is not here doing our part. Paul told the Roman church, for as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of each other. You see, the New Testament doesn't imagine a disembodied faith. Communion with God is tied to communion with one another. The church is imperfect, I know that. But for better or worse, we are Corpus Christi. We are the body of Christ in the world. We are body together. But when we are not all together, we are limping and blind. We are not at our best when one of us is not here taking up the function. Paul was shaking up this popular Platonism by saying that God has not structured the world as spirit over there, church and the holy things, and then body over here in the world. You can't satisfy the Christian life by just seeking out private little holy chambers This is flesh stuff, in church, out of church. You teach Sunday school, you greet people at the door, you serve on committees, you go to Miami and serve underserved children and teach them how to read. You bring snacks for the youth gatherings. You write checks and wipe other people's babies. In here, out there, it's all together, family and work, school and club, 
This is an embodied faith. We are the body of Christ. But blind and limping and incomplete when one of you is not here. Bishop Will Willimon rightly said, the challenge of biblical faith is not do you agree or do you feel, but will you join up? We're beginning a new church year, so I'm just asking if you'll join up. We need all the parts of the body of Christ together to tell this great story well. The liberating truth of God became flesh, dwelt among us, set us free from fear. We've been called to something as big as being the body of Christ in the world. We are the ambassadors of that grace. We are the agents of God's love. We are the body of Christ, and it takes every one of us. Not one person in here too important. Not one person unimportant. You may think, just for a minute, that the hand might be more important than the right toe. Go for a week without a right toe, get back to me. There are no unimportant parts. But Paul's image that we are the body of Christ is right on target. And he said, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but think of yourself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So when I was told, Doc, you can't sing, prepare a devotional. That's the way it works. Because we all have something to contribute to carry the mission of God forward. We all represent some function in advancing God's kingdom project within the church and out in the world. Each person has something to give according to the measure of faith God has assigned. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy was taking a tour of the NASA Space Center. He's touring around with the guide. He saw a guy sweeping up, and he walked over and introduced himself, spoke to the guy who was sweeping the floor. He said, hi, I'm Jack Kennedy. What is your job here? The man said, uh, well, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. He got it, every function matters. We're at the beginning of a school year. We're at the beginning of a new church year. You're at home uh, pulling up your outlook and entering all the school calendar stuff in there and the business trips and the family wedding and the football schedules and the band practice. Where is church operating in that landscape of priority. I'm asking Will Willimon's important question. The, the, the challenge of biblical faith is not do you agree or do you feel, but will you join up? It's not a complicated word study. The word disciple is from the same root as disciplined. We show up. We join up. We profess to be a disciple of Christ, so we discipline ourselves to service, and community, and learning. When we open our calendars, we prioritize the most central commitments to Christ and His church, before we put in jazz night at the high, or before we schedule the summer tuba camp or whatever. We calendar our full commitment to service within the church of Jesus Christ. 
We show up and join up because the body doesn't function unless we're all here doing our part. The ministry lags, the mission falters unless the body is working together. The New Testament never imagines a faith that is disconnected from congregational life. And we are at our excited best when we're all here together. You are the body of Christ. You are witness to God's love in the world. Go be hands and feet. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this hour at Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. We count it an honor that you let us into your homes each week. Some of you are viewing us on the AIB network, others of you on YouTube. However you let us be a part of your life, we're grateful that you're inviting us into your home. I continue to be impressed with how many people find this a meaningful part of their week. Uh, I had a woman stop me not long ago a woman I'd never met, and hugged me and said, uh, you're my pastor. Uh, we count that a privilege, that we are that much a part of who you are. I hope if you're physically able, you'll join us at 2715 Peachtree Road and be a part of the worship service uh, live. But we also appreciate that we're able to provide this service to folks who are not physically able to be here. However you're viewing us, we are honored by the fact that you do so and look forward to meeting you soon. Yeah. 